you don't know who I am, I'm Phil, I'm the lead minister here, and it's my privilege to open up our series on Revelation. No pressure whatsoever uh, this morning. I'm going to start by asking you a question. What are you living for? Do you have a vision of what the, where your life is going and what you are living for? For some of us, that vision is simply money. It's to be successful in our jobs, to, to have more, to have a, a nicer life, to be able to create a, a more comfortable existence and a, and a bigger house and a nicer car and, to, and to, to continue to succeed. And I think there's something in that. I think there is a truth. I think it's one of the greatest truths ever said that a, that a happy wife, is a happy life. And that could be a vision for your life, right? I, I, I think there is a lot of truth to that saying. But is that really it? Maybe our vision, if we're being a little bit more spiritual, might be to say, actually, no, my, my vision, my dream of the future, my hope for the dream is that I want, I want to know Jesus more. And I want to grow in my relationship with him. Maybe we, we might say that actually in today's world, actually our, our vision for this future, our vision is, is actually just to kind of hold on to our faith, to make sure that that's intact so that when we get to the end of life, we've remained faithful. Because the pressures and the, and the, the disaster that's going on around the world amongst us means that even if I can just say I've held on to faith, I've succeeded. Maybe our vision is for our kids if we're blessed with kids, that our kids might know Jesus. Or maybe there's something more. Maybe there's a bigger picture of a vision of a future, of, a, of what is to come that we can hold on to. And I want to say as we jump into this series on Revelation, that that picture is heaven. That we need a greater, clearer picture, vision of what heaven is and perhaps what it's not. That, f that just drives us forward. That says this is the end. This is where we're going. This is, this is the, the, the desire, the vision, the purpose, the future. And this is what we are going towards. So much more than just us as individuals being comfortable or being happy or succeeding or simply holding on to our faith, but a greater, clearer, bigger vision to pursue heaven. As we um, jump into this Revelation series, I want to say that the book of Revelation gives us that picture. Yes, it's a complicated book, and we'll come to some of that stuff in a moment. But it gives us a clear picture of where the end is. At the beginning of the year, we um, did a sermon series on Genesis in the book of Genesis titled How It All Began. And so we're now jumping into this sermon series on Revelation, thinking about how it finishes, where we are heading. T.S. Eliot says, And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. Some of you are looking at me panicked. Don't worry, I haven't started reading poetry. Someone fed me that line. Uh, you know that I just, my sermons, I quote Foo Fighter lyrics, not T.S. Eliot. But um, it's a great line. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. We start with the end in mind. And we, if we can have a clear picture of what the end is, we can orientate our lives in that direction. Um, I was told a story, uh, a friend of mine was telling a story of when he was down, I think it was in Dartmouth, and he was trying to cross the river estuary on his paddleboard. And he knew that, that he, where he wanted to get to on the other side, and he started aiming for that place, and of course, the current and the tide took him way downstream, and he missed it completely. And he realized that if he wanted to get to that certain point on the other side, he actually had to aim upstream. And as he aimed upstream, that stream would then, current would then take him to the destination that he wanted to go. 
C.S. Lewis says this. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world are just the ones that thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves, who set foot on the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Aim at heaven and you'll get the earth thrown in. Aim at the earth and you'll get neither. We aim upstream. We have to know the destination of what we are aiming for. St. Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to set our mind on a vision and a picture of what heaven is. Shall we pray? And then we'll jump in. Loving Father, we thank you for this incredible book. And Lord, we know that it's complex. We sometimes run away from it. There's bits of it that are so difficult to understand. But yet you want to give us a clear picture, a vision of what heaven is. To call us to aim higher, to think of heaven. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'll speak to us this morning. Give us a clear picture that you want us to have and you'll help us to orientate our lives around your truth, your hope, your future. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's start by talking some generics about the book of Revelation because it is complex. If you've ever tried to read it, you will know that it is a complex book. The first few chapters of the book are quite nice, and the end chapters are quite nice, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that's really, really weird. But it's okay, because I'm not going to tackle those chapters. Ian Paul says that the book of Revelation is the most extraordinary piece of literature ever written. And the book of Revelation gets its name from the, the first line of the whole book of Scripture. Uh, it says, the revelation from Jesus Christ. And this word revelation um, in Greek is the word apocalypsis, which means, uh, it's where we get the apocalyptic language and understanding, but it means the unveiling of something previously unveiled. The unveiling of something previously unveiled. It is a picture of something yet to be seen. The, un the revealing, the revelation of heaven. Now there is no doubt that the person who wrote the book of Revelation is a guy called John. There is a load of scholarly debate about which John wrote Revelation. And um, if you want to tackle some of that stuff, by all means... I'm going to go on the presumption that it is the Apostle John writing the book of Revelation. Probably in about the year 95 AD, so probably about 60 years after the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, John, who had been an apostle, who had seen Jesus, by this point was an old man. And he had been banished to the island of Patmos because he kept preaching the risen, living Jesus. And so John has this revelation, this picture from God given to him that he writes to the church. And he's writing to a scattered church, a church that is, full, that is under the pressure of persecution. It's living under the, the Greek and the Roman empires, kind of influencing them and shaping them and challenging them. It's trying to hold them down. It's trying to kind of get them to do things that they were saying, this isn't what the gospel is all about. And so he's writing this 
pastoral letter. It is a letter from his heart to encourage them to keep going. Don't allow yourselves to be influenced or to compromise to the Greco-Roman world or to the pagan influences upon the church. Hold firm to truth. Hold firm in this battle that we face. Keep going because Jesus ultimately wins the victory. I don't know whether any of that resonates with you. A persecuted church that's being taught to, in, to compromise and be influenced by the rest of the world around us. And actually at this point, we need to hear these words more than ever. To keep going, to persevere because Jesus has won the victory. To know what the final story, how it finally ends. <coughs> and so John is writing to encourage us. It is full of Jewish apocalyptic language. In much the same way of uh, the book of Daniel and the Zechariah, there's all sorts of imagery and language in the book of Revelation that's very complex to understand. We've got to understand, though, that the language is highly symbolic. It is poetry, not prose. And so we pick up different pieces as we understand the language and the imagery of the day. A way to I, that's helped me to understand this is if I said to you this morning, and possibly you saw it as you were coming here today to church, that it's raining cats and dogs, you would know what that means. Or some of you do. I wonder if we put that into a poem now, I mean, it probably make poor poetry, but if we put that into a poem now, and someone 2,000 years later has to read that, that it was raining cats and dogs, how they might interpret that language. Cats and dogs falling out of the sky. That's weird. So we have to understand, as we read the book of Revelation, that there is language and imagery in it that at the time made perfect sense that they got the understanding of what it means. But now, as we read it 2,000 years later, it is complex and it's difficult for us to get our heads around. So we're going to start at the end, as T.S. Eliot has encouraged us to do. We're going to jump straight to Revelation chapter 21 and 22 this morning. As I said earlier, there's the beginning part of Revelation, which we'll come back to, is quite is, is brilliant and we'll understand it. The stuff in the middle is really complex. Now, David Bracewell, my father-in-law, has written a book on the book of Revelation. He loves it that much. He studied it so much. He's written a book. So he's going to come and do two sessions, two extra sessions, not within our Sunday morning services, but on the 1st and the 8th of July, two Monday nights, if you're in a community group, I might wanna, uh, you sh might want to think about stopping your community group that week and coming to those sessions on the 1st and the 8th of July as he helps us to unpick some of that middle chapters of the book of Revelation just so that we can get our heads around it. But one of the themes that runs all the way through Scripture, uh, through Revelation, is the story of cities. Seven cities. God writing to the cities. And uh, in our mission statement, our vision statement, we're here to play our part in transforming the city and beyond. And so we're going to use that language of transforming the city as part of this narrative as we journey our way through the book of Revelation. So whilst I'm starting it today, for our series of Revelation today, we're actually going to take a two-week slight detour, because next week um, we have Luke coming to talk to us about compassion. Last year we started our understanding what it means for us to to work with compassion, to help children who are trapped in poverty. And he's going to come and talk to us about that again next week. The week after, we're going to think about refugees, because it's Refugee Sunday. And then we're going to jump back into Revelation in three weeks' time. But let's start at the end, in Revelation chapter 21, this morning. So we're going to read this, chapter 21, starting at verse 1, just verse first seven verses. <coughs> Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. It's a stunning passage, and it uses the word new many times. New heaven, a new earth. I am making all things new. There will be a new Jerusalem, which is code for new temple, actually. I'm even going to make people new, new people who are beyond the reach of death, pain, and crying, because I am making all things new. Now, in Scripture, there are two words predominantly used in the Greek text for the word new. There is neos, which means brand new. I've bought a brand new car, new. But there is also kainos, which is translated as like fresh or like new. So if you took your car to be fixed, and then suddenly as you got it back from the garage, the car was driving, you might say it's driving like new. Kainos. John uses the word kainos in the word new here. I'm going to make things, all things, like new, recreated, restored. There are two big themes as we understand this passage to help us to understand it. There are two big biblical themes that help us to go work all the way through this. And this is all the way in the Bible from the beginning and the end. The biblical theme starts with creation, decreation, and recreation. God is making all things new. How we see this and how we understand this is seen in where God dwells. There's a really bad joke, and I'm about to apologize for saying this joke, but I feel like I need to say it. Um, There are two little boys who are on a playground and they're talking to each other, and they say, where, where do you think God lives? And the first boy says, oh, he, he lives in heaven. And the second boy goes, oh, no, I, I think he lives in the toilet. And the boy's like, what? How on earth? What do you mean God lives in the toilet? He goes, well, every time mum walks past, she says, oh, God, are you still in there? That, that, that landed, that one, better than I expected it to. I, um, but where does God live? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we have this incredible story of God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. He's looking for them. He is literally dwelling with them in the garden. Creation. God has created us and everything in it so that he can dwell, live with, belong with, be amongst us in fully in creation. God's desire, right from word go. And then we messed up. And sin enters the world. And we decide to reject God and live for ourselves. And by the end of Genesis chapter 3, God has banished humanity from the garden. Creation has happened and then decreation sits in. And from that point onwards, in the story of Scripture, all the way through, is God wanting to draw us back to dwell with us again. As you read the, the story of the Israelites, it starts with the, um, God having the tent of dwelling, literally a tent where he might dwell with the people. Then we get to the tabernacle, which is the portable version of the temple. And then we have the temple. God coming to dwell amongst his people, to live amongst humanity. None of these things fully work 
And so eventually, through the incarnation, God takes on blood and flesh and moves into the neighborhood. Literally, God comes and dwells amongst his people. Jesus lives amongst his people, dwelling with them. Jesus dies. Jesus resurrects from the dead. Jesus ascends to heaven. And then he sends his Holy Spirit. Because whilst Jesus was one person living on earth amongst his people, suddenly now God is saying, I'm going to send my spirit to live in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians chapter 1. So that God may dwell in us where we are. Creation, decreation, and then this story of recreation as God is drawing us back into full relationship with him. And then in Revelation 21, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God longs to dwell with us. To be with us. It's the story of creation, decreation, recreation. It's the the story of scripture all the way through for you and for me, that he is drawing us back into relationship with him. And it is ultimately fulfilled in this picture of the new heaven and the new earth given to us all. But whenever we see recreation, people putting things back like new, we see God at work, joining in, this biblical kingdom principle of seeing and joining in with God in the work that he's doing in the the world. The word story, if I may be so bold. This building sold off 30 years ago. And then seven years ago, we took back a um, derelict building to bring back a, a family, a community of believers in this place to worship Jesus. It is part of the recreating, making this like new. Isaiah 58 verse 12 says that we are to be repairer of broken walls and the restorer of streets with dwellings. When you see that recreation taking place, it is God's work and we get the privilege of joining in with it. The garden out the back of the, out out the back derelict, head-high brambles, and we get to recreate and make it like new. Then if you've seen, there's a um, news article that's gone out recently saying that the Friargate Goods Yard, just down the road, a uh, massive building that's covered in graffiti at the moment and has been derelict for years and years and years. Um, planning permission has gone through. And uh, David Clowes, has put in a 55 million bid to restore that building, to make it like new, to put in homes and shops and gyms and restaurants, kinos, to make it like new. Whenever we see that recreating work of God, we know that it is that moment of all things like new, recreation. And so if you are in that kind of work. You're doing the work of God. Now, for some of us, that may be that we are engineers and we are coming up with plans and designs and we're structuring stuff and we're making it like new and we're doing it. But also, this works for those of us who are making humans like new. Those of us who uh, who perhaps are in the uh, healthcare, you are making them like new. You are trying to care for them, restore them. Perhaps people who are in uh, work in kind of therapies, and um, look, counselling and all that type of stuff. You're trying to make people like you. You are entering into the work of God. Recreating. This is the story of God at work. And you are getting to join him in it. Because God does it for people. Not just for buildings or gardens. A couple of weeks ago we had um, the privilege of baptising nine people. 
is the service that will last long in my memory of hearing people tell stories of how God is making them like me, restoring them, healing them, transforming their lives, because that is the work that God does. And it was prophesied hundreds of years before we get the, uh, the, uh, the passage from Revelation, it's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 65. Verse 17, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and will take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. God wants to recreate you, to restore you to what you were created to be, to forget the former things, to wipe clean that slate and all the stuff that we that hold on to so much, but actually to give you a fresh sense of this is who you are in God. You are his people dwelling with him. You are his child whom he loves and are, is well pleased. God is making all things new and it includes you. As part of that, there is a new heaven and a new earth. Now, we have an understanding, or we may have an understanding, of this concept that heaven is somewhere up in the sky. And we get a little bit from Genesis, we get a little bit from the Greek um, philosophy and understanding of stuff, that heaven is some kind of other place, and that's where God dwells. And we also get it from those hideous Philadelphia adverts back in the 90s, where they were sitting on clouds and eating cream cheese, or nowadays it's, you know, drinking a Red Bull and having wings and flying off into the clouds and being with God. But heaven is up there, it is other than. But the picture that we get in Revelation 21 is that there is a new heaven and a new earth. And they collide together. Earth being our dwelling place. It's where humans live. This is where we are. And heaven being the dwelling place of where God is. And then suddenly these two things collide. Heaven and earth. New heaven, new earth into a holy city. A new Jerusalem. God is making all things new. And so the picture of what this holy city is going to be, this this idea that this is where we are going to spend eternity with God, pours out as we read on in Revelation 21 and 22. The first thing to note is that it's a city, it's not a garden. We, We started the story of Scripture in a garden, the Garden of Eden. But that creation, decreation, recreation story brings us into a city. A city tends to be full of people. A city tends to be loud, full of drama and activity. A garden tends to be quiet and on your own, but a city, we are in this together. So it's busy, full and a loud city, but it is a beautiful city. As you read on in chapter 21, we get to verse uh, 19, and I don't fully understand what all of these things mean, but somebody might. The foundations of its city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second was sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth. I, mean, I, I don't know what those words are. But I do know that they mean jewels, that they're beautiful, that they are precious, and that this city will be full of these things. Precious, beautiful jewels. It goes on to talk about gold. The 12 gates, there are 12 pearls, each gate made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. (coughs) So it's going to look amazing. 
The new heavens and the new earth will look beautiful. They will be stunning. The next thing to note is that it's a city that is full of symmetry. One of the things that um, apparently, uh, apparently a, a beautiful face is a symmetrical face. I don't, again, fully understand that, and I I'm don't feel like I'm particularly blessed with that. But that's what um, people will tell me. But the city, the holy city, is full of symmetry. Verse 16, the city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and was as wide and high as it is long. The city is beautiful, full of jewels and gold. It is symmetrical, and it is overwhelmingly bright. Verse 23, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The light in us, the city of God, the holy city, is from God himself. Pure and brilliant and brighter than anything we can imagine. The city also includes people from every nation. I've been, um, I don't know whether I've been mocked this morning or whether they've, be, they've just wanted to point it out, but we are, have an increasing number of South African accents within our community, which we love, and you are really, really welcome. But read this, Revelation uh, verse 21, verse 24, the nations will walk by its light. Picking up from Psalm 77 where it talks about every trunk, every tar- tribe, every nation. All nations are included in this. So in this holy city, the new city, beautifully bright, full of people, full of the light of God shining, it will be full of every tribe and every nation. And then as you read on, Chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So it's a beautifully clear river. Not one of our British rivers. A beautifully crystal clear river, flowing. The water of life. Down the middle of the great street of the city, the straight seat of the street of the city, is paved of gold. And on either side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. What a stunning picture. It is more beautiful. It is bigger. It is better. It is brighter than possibly we can ever have imagined of what heaven looks like. Well, a new earth and a new heaven collide in this new holy city that we are being drawn towards. There is a story of creation, decreation, recreation, culminating in a holy city where God longs to dwell with you and me, to call us his children, to walk with us, to be with us, because he is making all things like new. And that includes you. He's putting us back together. He's recreating us to dwell with him for eternity in the most beautiful, stunning place. And this is the vision that we get to live for. We get to give everything for that vision, to build it, to join God in the work of recreating things in our world right now, to invite people to it, to invite others to come and join us in the midst of it. Because in Revelation 22, verse 17, we finally hear this invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water 
of life. Jesus is inviting you and me to come and join him where the new earth and the new heaven collide in the holy city. Come. You might be thirsty. You might be spiritually thirsty, longing for something more than just this. Because this life that we see before us does not satisfy. It does not give us all the answers. And so we live for something else, to lift our eyes to the heavenlies, to not dwell on the earthly, but to look to the heavenly things above and to receive that gift of eternal life, the water of life. Come and drink. Come and see that this is more beautiful. Come and be part of this picture of heaven. Come and join in in recreating with God. Come. Because right at the end of the whole Bible, Revelation 22, verse 20, he who testifies to these things, that is Jesus, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you.